I don't want to go on a rant here or off on you know a tangent a different than you know I'm trying to stick to the topic but the reason I'm doing this uh, uh, this great talk I'm looking forward to the talk with Rodolfo the founder and CEO of uh, Conkite Cold Card Wallet uh, most of you listeners followers you know him already it's uh, probably the best hardware wallet that's been, ever been created and manufactured uh, when it comes to security, to usability even. So, you know, uh, fascism, dictatorial regimes, uh, tyranny, uh, the coercion is rising everywhere. Uh, I'm in Austria, now they're sending police uh, with machine guns. I mean, these are not regular police people to check on people in restaurants or any other locations whether they are uh, whether they have their you know so-called vaccination pass or whether they're vaccinated they've got the papers or the QR code so it's starting it's this is not subtle actually or this is more this is more obvious than ever um, and they want to push this is what actually the Chancellor of Austria this new Chancellor the, the old one resigned because of corruption and fraud and everything and all criminal prosecutions going on against the old one uh, um, so yeah so without going on a rant um, it becomes more and more important to take care of your property your Bitcoin and all you need is actually you know all you need is 12 or 24 words in your head but you know if you do if, if you do want to you know uh, take care of your backups your uh, seed phrase and you want to move out of the country out of any country would it be australia if you can if you're allowed to or austria europe from ev anywhere to some of the few countries that are left where you can still enjoy freedom and human rights because human rights are actually not given or taken it's it's a natural thing you know it's un uh, it's unalienable it is nobody can take it away from you this is what is how it should be of course but they want to you know they want to inject you with the experimental gene editing mrna uh, substance highly toxic you don't know the long-term consequences now they even found out that spike proteins go into the nucleus of your cell so we don't actually know and the adverse reactions and the deaths are staggering but of course it's underreported with this we're talking about america european union the number of deaths immediately or pretty much uh, immediately or uh, Pretty soon after the injection, a lot of people got adverse reactions or uh, died. So what do you do? I mean, you have to move out of you know of this country. And I'm, I don't want to know. You know, I wonder how many people and businesses and companies are just gonna close their shops, close their companies, just you know pack their stuff and just go somewhere. Would it be South America or any you know or free private cities, citadels, whatever that be? So that's why it's so important to have, you know, total security and uh, take care of your, you know, sort of have a redundancy, a backup plan and uh, have uh, plausible deniability, decoy wallets and, you know, just make sure you're on the safe side. And that's why I wanted to bring on back uh, Rodolfo to speak about Taproot, amongst others, which has been activated now and needs to do some follow-up developments, of course, on all kinds of wallets, privacy, security, uh, plausible deniability, decoy wallets. So I hope you're going to enjoy this. Let me know what you think. And use the discount coin Davani, D-A-V-A-N-I, my family name, for uh, if you want to uh, order a cold card. Um, or any other products on CoinKite from CoinKite and yeah hope you enjoyed this let me know what you think welcome to the Kevin Davani connection show all right welcome welcome to the show Rodolfo how are you doing man it's been a long time it's been a long time indeed <laughs> okay listen um it's it's really crazy um, what's going on in Austria right now. I don't know what, whether you're up to date. So my daughter is with me right now. Uh, she's going to be picked up soon. So and then we can talk freely. Um, Rodolfo, um, you know, I was thinking the whole scenario um, of emigrating, you know, to other countries. A bunch of people that are emigrate to other to other countries, right? And I also talked recently to Gigi, and he confirmed that. So, you know, I was thinking. What are people doing? I mean, are there? Do you have any experience? Like, do you hear any testimonials from people? How they deal with, 
security, privacy, with uh, plausible deniability, with decoy wallets that are actually necessary, I think. Um, and I'm just talking about like single wallet. I'm not even talking about uh, multi sig because I think even, you know, for, for a special constellation, I think it would be necessary. But let's just take, you know, you have a single cold card, single wallet, but, you know, and then you want to move on, you know, you want to move out of your country, you want to travel. Um, how would people, you know, what, what's your take? You know, I want to talk to you about Taproot, pl uh, privacy, security, plausible deniability and decoy wallets, most of all. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, I mean, Bitcoiners are really in the move right now. I mean, it, it's becoming quite obvious that like people are moving and they have been for the last couple, like couple of years now. I uh, think the majority are seeking uh, tax uh, friendly jurisdictions uh, more than anything else uh, in regards to why move. Uh, I think people are waking up to the fact that like, know we're disproportionately being taxed for their success you know taxation is theft uh and uh you know I, I think i think people tolerated a certain amount of taxes uh, uh for a certain amount of freedom and a certain amount of government services but it seems that freedom is going to shit in most places and government services are going to shit in most places so people are sort of starting to get tired and before Bitcoin, it was very hard for you to move. I right? like, you know, you have you have your 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 equities or your like or your house and all that stuff is extremely uh, locally dependent in terms of registration of the ownership of those assets, right? Um, I think a lot of Bitcoiners, especially young Bitcoiners that don't have families yet, uh, that that acquire those those Bitcoins uh, non KYC. Um, you know, they're just going to remember 12 words and get the fuck out. Um, <laughs> it really is that simple. That's amazing. I mean, I mean, isn't that amazing? I mean, it's, it's like right. Unique, right. I mean, human history that, you know, you can just, it's, it's you, it's, <laughs> it's, oh. it's, that's it. You know, there's no physicality anymore attached to it. That's, that's amazing. If you're young, like you don't have a house yet, like ownership of a house. You, you probably don't have a lot of equities. You don't have any of this other stuff, right? And the, the smart young ones sort of went all in Bitcoin anyways, right? Uh, for the last few years. So, I mean, they have nothing but their clothes <laughs> and a laptop, right? In terms of true ownership. Uh, so, like, they could just wake up the next day, take a flight and not go back. You know, some countries will have exit tax and all that stuff. It gets complicated. People should seek legal advice and all that stuff. But, but like, aside from from like the the legal consequences, the tax consequences of exiting, um, there is technically and practically nothing that a government can do to hold these people back. You know, I mean, they would just take a plane and go. Wake up the next day in some island somewhere and, you know, with margaritas and people in bikinis and sort of like, that's it. <laughs> it, it it's, it's uh, I, I think once people start waking up to that, like governments are going to have to sort of come up with a plan uh, of like enticing these people not to leave, right? They're going to have to to do like Portugal or, or Germany did where, for example, there's no taxes to sell crypto after a certain amount of time right, right? you held for over a year you don't but it's changing Rodolfo. they're already a, a, they they submitted a proposal in austria to i think from february onwards to you know sort of put it on the same level like uh, some other assets like put a 30 percent capital gains tax or something like that until now recently you know it was like you know you wait a year and then no taxes right no capital no speculation tax nothing so it's the times to be honest with you is getting scary you know i my, my father's already dead uh he died like a couple of years ago he emigrated to austria with me he had been into austria like in the 58 late 50s 60s where i wasn't born yet of course so you know he emigrated 1979 you know iranian revolution like millions and millions of iranians emigrating like diaspora everywhere right <laughs> so 
you know, and I was thinking, yeah, Austria, you know, great countries, you know, very liberal, let's say, you know, liberal, you know, and, and, and very respectful of other people's rights, property rights, freedom. And now, you know, you're seeing all these, they are, people are philosophizing now about not only mandatory vaccine, you know, like sort of mandatory, mandatory, but, but it's like you see, uh, first of all, you see police people, like, like uh, Cobra people with machine guns checking on people in restaurants, whether they are vaccinated. I mean, this is, this is I could have never imagined that, Rodolfo, you know? So the motive is here. The incentive is here just to get out, but where to, I mean, are there any countries you would you would suggest? I mean, is there any country where you'd say, I mean, is there like a place like El Salvador? Um, can you, I mean, I heard, you know, for this, for the duration of the conference, like people are going to the conference, I wish I could go, but, you know, they're sort of exempt from all these, you know, uh, negative, uh, you know, giving a test or being vaccinated. But what if you want to stay there? Uh, what kind of pressure is there? issue is you know you know do you want to come back that's question number one right because that will help you define your action plan on how do you leave okay, that's that's the first thing especially in regards to your exit tax and everything else uh and then where to go is complicated because as i like to say most countries have a pro hodo tax uh, a setup where they force you to hold the Bitcoin and not sell because they have capital gains tax on the sale of the asset. So they're essentially forcing you to hold, <laughs> which is kind of... <laughs> That's a good um, incentive, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, then the next part is, you know, most countries, at least for, I, I think, for the next few years, will be uh, seeking to restrict uh, civil liberties. I, I don't I think that's a it's a global trend. Uh, I, I think most countries will be like that. Uh, US is the exception because US does have the Second Amendment and and you know red states will say, you know, fuck you and 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 have the means of of enforcing that fuck you. Um I I think it's the you know for all America has many problems, but uh, you know, they, they are the one of the only last places in the world where people have true freedom. Um, no, aside from KIC and MIL and all that kind of crap, but still, they have certain inalienable freedoms that they are able to to maintain. Um, and then, oh, you know, then these things also depend on what kind of wealth you have, right? Like the size of the, the amount of money you have, because you know, if you have a lot of money. There is a lot of fancy accounting companies that will help you structure things in a way that you know you you can play pay near no taxes too, right? And you can have ownership in very complicated schemas where you know be very hard for government to try to take it from you too. Um, so you know it, it's uh, it's complicated. You know the it's nice to have a passport of of another country because. But Most, not necessarily. I mean, you don't. You don't need maybe the pad. Maybe you just need a permanent like residency. I mean, is that is that a would you uh, think good option? See, if you are a citizen of a secondary country, uh, any Western country will likely respect that. So, say for example, if you were in Australia when they said that you cannot leave Australia, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you had a second citizenship, they cannot hold you. It, because they don't want that. That's a major issue, right? You are the citizen of a different country. And if you want to go back to that other country, you're kind of entitled to. So having a secondary citizenship, I think it's paramount for most people. Uh, I think it gives you some optionality. Um, the island passports are great and all, but at the same time, they have no teeth. Uh -huh. right? Those countries don't really have legal teeth, right? So it's not like they're going to fight your extradition or they're going to fight your right to return to, you know, Turks and Caicos. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's complicated. So, but, but they do have great tax jurisdictions there, right? Um, I, I think finding a country, so, so first is having a second citizenship is, is a mandatory thing. And then the second is 
maybe finding a country that is not necessarily perfect on the tax side of things, but uh, but does have some level of of law and order, and and it does have a certain level of freedom. Uh, I think will be sort of very very helpful. So yeah, that's a yeah, great suggestion. Yeah, so uh, let's go a little bit into the technicalities if you want. Um, how would you proceed? Like, how what would you suggest to people who let's say they want to you know they want to emigrate, they want to move out, they, but they don't know whether they're coming back or not, and they have you know they have the cold card. <laughs> How would you how would you go about that? Like, if you wanted, you know, to go like have sort of a redundancy, uh, <laughs> you know, when it comes to security, um, when a plausible deniability, how would you how would you go about that? So, so it gets a little tricky, right? Because, like, let's assume you are leaving a country that has no exit tax. Okay, just for purpose of legal framework. So you're not committing a tax, uh, a tax crime, right? By leaving with your money. Well, let's start from that premise. I think it's a good one to start from. So, you know, ideally, you do not take your hardware wallet through an airport, it, because it's not ideal. They can make you like you do have a suspension of civil liberties in airports. They can make you do things that technically they're not allowed to, right? So. You don't want to have to explain how to wallet. You don't want to have to have to log in, any of that stuff. I mean, a cold card, you can still brick the device, right? If that does happen and they make you turn it on, you just type in your brick me pin and the device is bricked. <laughs> right? Problem solved. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, you know, and then the other thing is, you know, so you have a few things to say, like move to the new place, right? So, you know, you buy a new hardware wallet, you ship it to the, the location that you're going to be in, in the mm -hmm. new country, right? And then you just find a way of bringing the seed with you, right? That yeah, is that's, it's memory. That's, that's a tr I mean, you just, yeah, I mean. It's not that hard, right? Because, you, you know, one is you can just like either remember the seed, you can, you know, like. Split it, it like, write it in the Bible or whatever. Like okay. the, you know, it's it's not like that hard to bring twelve, twenty four words with you. Da right? Vinci code, yeah. So <laughs> you can bring a, a encrypted micro SD, you know, in your camera or whatever. Like there's a million ways you can do that, right? Makes sense, yeah. Okay. And then when you arrive at a new location, you just load that back into your cold card and you're ready to go, right? And then on the new location, you do set up new, say, metal plates where you, you do your new setup. Or uh, even better is you travel to the new place, set up a new wallet there, set up uh, uh, metal backups properly as if you would, and maybe you return and then you make a transaction to the new wallet so that your old metal backups are sort of like, you know, essentially disposed uh, on your old place. So you do have to think about in terms of like, you know, old backups, new backups. You do have to have all that that like nicely sort of lined up. Um, if you're in Europe, because in Europe you can travel through many different countries very mm -hmm. easily, you know, it might be actually useful to do some seed XOR and put different metal backups in different, say, countries, right? Um, and, and you, you know, you can always make a visit to Switzerland or Monaco where they do have good privacy in safe deposit boxes, right? Right. Uh, and, and you can maybe put part of your backup there, right? Not the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then you also have passphrases and things like that. So this is all fairly straightforward. It's just a matter of sort of like making a plan, right? Don't just wing it. All right. Um, how would you, uh, how would you, how would you, uh, like go about when you wanted to create like okay let's say it's not about like government or, or taxes or um let's say it's about you know you you want to just you know not go into a risky situation where whatever uh duress or, or threats or you know being robbed or something like that or five dollar wrench attack um is there like is, is it easy to make a decoy wallet on your cold card yeah yeah it's fairly simple you know 
and you put can, some little well, amounts on it, you know, so it, at least it looks like as if there were multiple transactions already going on. So it looks like a credible, plausible deniability <laughs> wallet. You know, you, you make a decoy wallet, but I would also recommend using passphrase for your main wallet. Because even in your main wallet, let's say they beat you enough that like, you know, you, you say, okay, fine, I'm going to go into my real wallet, right? And then your real wallet, you can put some more money there, but it's not your real, real wallet. It's the real wallet without the passphrase. It, so, so you can have like different levels. So like create a nice labyrinth where you have like, you know, a few different levels of, of stuff and, and. And I think like another thing that people maybe sort of like don't don't put a lot of effort into is making sure you simply cannot sign the funds. So, you know, maybe you put your a passphrase that you cannot remember, even if you're drugged. Right. <laughs> and, and, and and then you put that passphrase in a different country. Mm -hmm. you have to actually travel there. Make a real big transaction. So so it's like, you know, it takes you a week or two. To, to get it done. So, so even under through the rest, right, you simply cannot produce the, the transaction. Oh, and then we can move into multi-sig and all that stuff too, which, you know, you can, you can do wonders with that, but it's like, it's just more stuff, right? When people are in the move, I think it's a lot better to have simpler setups. Uh, and then, yeah. then that's, that's why I'm not such a huge fan of multi-sig. I mean, I don't know it, may, it makes sense for certain situations or certain, I don't know, you know, maybe about when you talk, thinking about like, you know, checks and balances sort of, or inheritance plans, or I don't know what, 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 what's in what, like, when would multi-sig in what cases would it make sense to, you know, besides the fact, you know, you need to not only have all the keys, but also the map sort of, of the whole thing. So. I wouldn't advise it to noobs. This is what I'm trying to say. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, you could almost say that like passphrase plus seed does like produce like a very similar, uh, um, similar like security as multi-sig, right? Because it's like multiple parts, right? Um, but you know, multi-sig is fantastic. It's just that it does add a huge level of complication. It also requires a lot more backups. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. so, so now you have to like, you know, now you have three, four, five backups to store in different locations, because if you're storing the backups in the same location, you're kind of like defeating the purpose. Mm -hmm. right? um, so, so you do have that. Uh, now, you know, if you're somebody who has a considerable amount of funds and, and you do have uh, like multiple locations to store the backups, Right, and you are technically capable of maintaining that multi-signature wallet and all that stuff, then sure, I mean, go for it, right? But that's not the reality of most people, right? Most people are like renters. They have an apartment that they don't even own. So it's not like they can even like break a wall to stick a metal plate inside, right? Um, so it gets very complicated, uh, very fast, um, yeah. Are there uh, what kind of, I mean, I know, you know, there are uh, a bunch of people who are making you know, great tutorials, guides, which, which guides or tutorials would you, would you recommend? Or uh, are there other guides or tutorials also on cold card uh, website or, or, uh, or would you recommend like from BTC by BTC sessions that uh, are these like the specific questions we just discussed? Um, where would you look, where would you uh, send so, people? So, uh... We do have a bunch of guides uh, on our website, uh, codecard.com slash docs. And if you, right on the top, there is one link called community uh, made guides or something like that, where we collect a lot of the guides that other people have made, you know, BTC sessions or Matadel or whatever, right? So like we, we list those as well there. We try to collect everything in one place. Uh, there is a, we, we must have like 20 videos on YouTube just for different aspects of cold card as well. That there's like hundreds of people who also made videos about cold card and how to use it, right? Um, I think at the end of the day, challenge when it comes to practical uh, is that, you know, none of these videos are gonna tell you like, 
you know, where to put the backup or, or cause you know, nobody wants to dox their setup either. <laughs> so, so, you know, it gets complicated that way. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I think, I think it's important for people to reflect on like, okay, I have this, this important things. They have to be kept separated. Where do I put them? Right. You know, the government can go and, and get into a safe deposit box, for example. Mm -hmm. That's why we created CDXOR, because if you do want to use safe deposit boxes, which are great, uh, you want to make sure that the secret in the safe deposit box is not the full secret. It is plausibly deniable as well, right? So you could go on the CDXOR and you could deposit some, some, uh, uh, some honeypot money in one of the in one of the, the parts, right? And then if somebody gets to it, you actually know that they spent it, right? So, so you get a, a, a warning there. Uh, but yeah, so, so it's very important for people to sort of like put some effort into thinking about like, what, what are the attack scenarios? Who can get to the backups? Where the backups are going to be? If you die, how do the backups get to somebody that, you know, is going to get the money and all that stuff, especially if you have kids. Okay, so yeah, I was thinking like, you know, like specific, like you already, let's say, I suppose you already have a cold card, you have a single wallet, but then you want to add, you know, exactly what you just uh, elaborated on previously, you know, like, uh, you want to have like a main wallet and then sort of a decoy wallet and or your main wallet with a passphrase, but like, how would you do that? Like afterwards, after you, 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 you had already, you, you already set up, but you just want to like, uh, create those uh, those decoy wallets or or add passphrase. Mm -hmm. so, so part of the design of seed XOR was so that you can just XOR as an existing seed. You don't have to move the funds. Right. right? Now, when you're using passphrase, you have to essentially redeposit into the new wallet plus passphrase because passphrase is not a password. It's part of the secret. So. Uh, so, so yeah, so if you already have a, a seed plus passphrase, right? So you already are set up with a passphrase. It's very easy to seed XOR your seed. You just, you go the code card and you go, uh, I can't remember now export or whatever seed XOR, boom, it creates the, the two, the two parts for you and you just back those up and then you take your original backup and you put it somewhere else or destroy it, right? Um, and then, uh, and then if you, if you don't have a passphrase yet, then I'd recommend adding a passphrase and moving the funds to the passphrase wallet. Phrase truly is a wonderful feature. Mm -hmm. And what if you just have a, you know, single wallet without a passphrase, just a s simple, you know, without any, like, you I know, I would, I would definitely recommend moving the funds to passphrase. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it's a it's an exponential increase in security in, in in many different aspects, right? Like from uh, from having more options in terms of like having more accounts, because you could have multiple passphrases. You could uh, with the same seed. Um, you know, you do have now uh, plausible deniability on your original seed, uh, and you know, you you are adding more uh, more entropy to your original seed as well. So so there is a lot of things going on there that are very very interesting. Right. There was once a discussion on Twitter where you commented. You said you know, and I, I think I, I I confirmed sort of what you said at that time. It was something about like you know you can use the cold card. There's no excuse. There's no more excuse not to use the cold card because even a noob can use it now. You don't necessarily need to use it in an air what do you call it like in an air gapped uh fashion like you know with the micro sd card back and forth you can also use the what do you call it the the plug-in the, the the cable right the usb cable but there is this weird narrative out there um, where it's kind of like i don't know i don't know if it's competitor or if it's just i i can't explain but it's like there is people who say that you know Oh, cold card is the most secure, but it's not the easiest to use. And it's not true. If yeah. you just use cold card like you use other hardware wallets, right? By plugging in with an easy to use wallet, it's exactly the same experience. 
if anything, it's probably easier because it does have buttons. So like, you know, it's like, it's a, I don't know. It feels like there is a, it's like a competitor created narrative there so that people sort of go buy something else that's less secure, right? Right. But what if, what if people use, they don't, because, you know, I mean, when I use a cold card, I, I don't, I'm not plugging it into, you know, there's no, it doesn't touch the internet, right? Right. It's about like touching this, this, uh, you, you don't want to have this risk factor. So what if do, what if, you know, what if most, what if there are noobs who just, just want to plug it in and, and, you know, use it like the treasure, you know, like, like, Fine. It's actually more secure than the threads are plugged in still. Like See, you're still yeah. getting substantial amount of security here, right? Like that's can unclearable. You explain why? What's the difference with Coco when you use it like, you know, not air gapped, you know, with a micro SD card, but like, you know, just directly with the cable. So what's cool about air gap is that like it gives you security against the unknown unknown, right? Because no device is free of bugs. Nothing is like, you know, a hundred percent, right? So when you're not connected, you're simply not giving exposure, right? But, you know, there is like tens of thousands of people out there who use cold card on USB, right? And, and you know, it's, it's a fairly secure setup, right? You know, we have like a, a very, very secure USB setup. It is encrypted. It, it does a bunch of very interesting things there to maintain that security, right? And when the device is unplugged, it's a secure, physically secure device, right? You know, when you're using like something like a Trezor or whatever, like I don't think their USB is encrypted and, and when the device is unplugged, it's not physically secure. Uh -huh. right? so, so even using the cold card with USB, like you're still gaining like, you know, like a hundred times more security, let's say it that way, right? Uh, but you're doing it the easy way. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, let's talk about Taproot. <laughs> so, so the way I understand it is that the uh, uh, wallet makers, you know, like or hardware wallet makers, they need to somehow make it compatible with Taproot, right? I mean, it just not, it's not like automatic. You you can do automatic like tap, what, what, like what, what's what's the process here, like? Do we have to wait until cold card or you guys uh, at, like make changes? To, uh... yes. yes. So, so like Taproot is a whole new signature, right? It uses Schnorr. It doesn't use uh, um, a SHA, right? So RSA. Okay, so, maybe maybe okay. Uh, just just for you know general understanding, what is what's Taproot? Gonna, you know, does it increase privacy fungibility? Yeah, so, so like I think people are overblowing a little bit, right? Because it's exciting, you know. It's an incremental improvement to Bitcoin, but it is a fundamental change. The new cryptographic formula. Let's put it this way, right? So instead of using the old way of signing Bitcoin transactions, we're using a new formula, okay? So it's kind of important to know that that's why for devices that sign Bitcoin, right? Like cold card, it's very important to move slow <laughs> because, you know, we don't want to ruin people's money, right? So, you know, um, we have a tendency to not just make those changes like immediately. Right, like you know, it's in development, and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be there at some point. Right, there is no need to start moving stuff around, especially people who have funds in cold storage. Don't don't move stuff, right? Like, right. Don't move funds just because there is a new feature out there. Um, so, uh, you know, but it is really cool. Like you know, the transactions are cheaper mm -hmm. to make. The, the, you cannot tell the difference anymore between multi-sig and single sig, the new address type. But right now, the great majority of the transactions in the network are not going to be per transactions, right? So what about privacy? I mean, what, what does it mean? It, it increases privacy or, uh, you, or well, so the, the only increase, the only real increase in privacy is the fact that you cannot tell if it's a multi-sig transaction or a normal transaction. It's the same address type. Okay, that's it. So there's nothing like beyond that, like, you know, 
make it more like I don't know more more pseudonymous more anonymous or or more non trackable you know like like what, what what's the connection with chain analysis can chain analysis does it it doesn't have like any more like tools to uh, to so, track so or? the only difference is that you're not going to be able to see what multi sig is right gotcha so so what's nice is that if for example if you're using lightning right you're not going to be able to tell that you're going into a multi-sig for a lightning channel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the main thing. What we really want to come in is what's going to come later on. It's called signature aggregation. It's still not part of Bitcoin. What, but is, what does it mean? It means that you can aggregate a bunch of signatures in a transaction that doesn't look like it's a bunch of signatures. Essentially. So it's actually really cool. You would make coin join extremely, extremely um, not visible. So, but you know, that's another update for later on. Who knows how many years it's going to take, right? Uh, in Bitcoin, we move slow, don't break things, right? So, um, so yeah. So, so that's sort of like the thing about Schnorr, and and because of a lot of aspects of how Taproot Schnorr works. There's going to be other types of, of uh, between quotes, smart contracts you can do. Um, you know, there's a lot of like little aspects like that. So, so there is like improvements in a lot of different things, but it's all improvements. It's not like, you know, like that we're sort of, you know, all of a sudden fully private or all of a sudden whatever, right? It's, it's all in small improvements. Uh, another very cool thing is that because we're changing signature type, Schnorr has a formal proof. So we know for sure that it doesn't have a backdoor. Like RSA, which we just assume that it doesn't. Uh, which is nice. So like if, if we ever find the issue with RSA, uh, which is unlikely, um, it, you know, we have this other signature that's already part of Bitcoin. So now we essentially have a backup signature type. Very cool. Uh, it gives Bitcoin, like, you know, a lot more security. Um, so, yeah, that, that's sort of what it is there. And then threshold signatures, which is MUSIG, a multi-sig. Uh, MUSIG uh, allows you for a lot more interesting, um, essentially, multi-signature schemas, right? Because it's a threshold of amount of being signed as opposed to uh, M of N. So, so, you know, there's nothing developed for that yet, by the way. Like, I, I don't know of any wallet that's doing MoSig yet. Uh, maybe I missed something. But still, like, we're going to have a lot of services and products coming onto the market. They're going to have a lot of interesting multi-signature solutions once MoSig gets sort of, like, adopted and developed. Mm -hmm. um, let me uh, ask you a little bit. Off topic because it just it just uh, popped in my mind. Um, do you think uh, we will ever be able to somehow make use of the what do you call it the dust, you know, the the, the dust of the sats that are somehow accumulated in uh, you know some of the wallets? Like, can we make use of it? Do we have to wait until you know Bitcoin reaches? Uh, oh, so. I think what's going to happen soon is that the dust limit setting in most wallets will increase or decrease, however you want to look at it. So you're going to be able to move dust because it has economical value now, right? Another thing too is, you know, if the blocks remain quite near free, they are now, it should be very cheap to move those, those dust inputs, right? Because... Normally, the issue is the, the input is so small and you need so many to make a transaction that's you know, economically viable versus the fee to consolidate, right? Yeah. I think what's going to happen is as Bitcoin price goes up, we're going to find more, uh, more interest in consolidating dust inputs into economically viable uh, inputs. Oh, yeah, no, I understand. Okay, got you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. Because I've always wondered, you know, what's going to happen to all that dust, you know, if, if Bitcoin goes to, you know, exponential uh, 
values, you know, what <laughs> what's going to happen to the dust? That's, that was my question all the time along. But yeah, it makes sense now. Yeah. So, Rodolfo, um, I know you probably told that story a lot, many times when we were in other podcasts, but how did how did you like what was your path to to cold car like how did you get this idea that did you did you look at other like wallets and you and, and you you know you saw for yourself the opportunity to make a much better product or, or, what's the story behind that behind cold car so you know coinkite is like one of the oldest bitcoin companies that exists right like we, we were doing bitcoin essentially hardware security modules and, and things on the server side for for many 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 years. I think when our first products hit the market in 2012 or 2011, uh, and you know we we made Bitcoin debit cards back in 2012 2013, and so we we had all this infrastructure right for for secure Bitcoin operations, and and for for Bitcoin multi sig, you know, and all that stuff back way back then. It was too early, um, and. Uh, we, you know, we, we didn't want to be in the service side of security. We didn't want to run or custody funds for people. We sort of like, we didn't want to do that anymore, right? It's not something we're personally interested in. So, you know, we shut that all off. And, uh, and then we were sort of like looking for uh, a security solution for ourselves. It's like, okay, you know, I need to store my stuff. And, the you know, we bought pretty much every hardware wallet that was in the market and, you know, like looking at them, examining them. It's like, you know, I don't want to use any of these. They don't work for me, right? Uh, they're either not secure enough, not open enough or whatever, right? It's just not what I want to use. So you literally did this sort of a forensic like analysis. Like yeah. oh. we, we, you know, we bought it all and, and wow. we sort of analyzed them all and sort of just we were like, okay, great. Well, let's just make our own hardware wallet. So we you know, started the project and sort of did a lot of research and, and sort of figure out a design that worked for us, that was the right set of, the right set of trade-offs. Uh, and uh, we launched CodeCard and like as a, just like an open project. And, you know, it's like a lot of people wanted it. So we we're like, okay, great. Then let's make this into an actual commercial product so that it can service the market. And, uh, and then that was it. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, we sort of made it into a product and, and that grew. Uh, at the same time, we had Open Dime and other things going on at the same time. So, uh, you know, we love making hardware and, and, you know, we hate making services. So, uh, so we just focused on that. That's a fantastic product, man. Uh, really. Um, you know, I mean, hardware is hardware. Do you have like any evaluations or, I don't know, assessment of, durability i mean you know it, what about the micro sd card is it possible that it it doesn't you know it's not function anymore or one thing the one part or the other other part is it's like uh do you have experience with that are there any testimonials you've you've received from when it comes to hardware durability we do a lot of testing and we get a lot of user feedback right uh but th there is two things that people need to keep in mind Bits rot and hardware burns. <laughs> okay. okay. So you cannot depend on digital backups against fire and like real water damage or, or environmental damage, right? Well, okay. And and the reality is most Bitcoiners are not gonna be robbed. They're gonna have their houses burn or something, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And house fires are extremely common. So hardware longevity it is less of a consideration than it is to have a metal backup on a seed plate, right? You know, so so you should really look at from that perspective as opposed to the hardware lasting, right? You know, I mean, listen, some of those chips are rated for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. you, you know, like for example, I think the 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 six hundred eight B, like the secure element, is rated between twenty and a hundred years or something. But like, you can't trust that. Like, look at the range that they are giving you, right? It's absurd. So, um, you know, something can happen, right? And, and there is the facts and things, so you can't depend on that. The micro SD cards that we sell are extremely good quality, right? We, we 
you know, you see that like, you know, other vendors will sort of say industrial card and here is it comes for free with the package or whatever. It's likely because it's shit. So uh, real true SOC memory, like the, 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 the highest grade of this kind of, of memory, right, um, is very expensive. And, and, and we use the highest grade of that, which is the ones that have the, the highest temperature latitude and ESD protection and all that stuff for the micro SD. So we, we really try to source the best that there is. Um, they don't come cheap. They're small size micro SDs, right? I think the ones we sell are from 256 megabytes to about two gigabytes, depending on the batch. We try to source the best price we can for the best quality we can, and it just rotates in the store. Whatever we have, it's what we have. Um, and, you know, and, and we also check that those cards are not fakes because, like, you know, a huge amount of the cards out there, even from reliable sources, are fake. Really? Yeah, yeah it's very hard to do with that. So, like, That's you have really to you know, so x-ray the cards and do all kinds of shit to, to oh, figure out if they're legit. So how can the average person, like, differentiate, like, I mean, what, what is, like, uh, I mean, what, what if you ordered, I don't know, on Amazon, like, from, like, Don't buy microSD cards on Amazon. Okay. Mm -hmm. they are just they, they are not set up to to be able to tell what is fake and what's not fake right it's just not their competency right mm -hmm. uh, so so don't uh wrong place to buy high quality media it's just the reality of it uh and then there's a lot of mislabeling as well so you know sometimes you're gonna get like a, a it's a semi-fake so so like you know they'll get like a a, a lower grade industrial card, but then they'll stamp it as just industrial or they'll stamp it as like industrial whatever, but like it's not really the right thing in there. So, so like it, it really gets tricky. Um, really, really tricky. Um, so, so, you know, if you're going to buy industrial micro SD cards, you have to buy from real sources uh, or, or places that do testing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm I'm in Austria, in the European Union. So, uh, so, you, so if people want to still like order your your stuff, your products, um, it, it would still come directly from from. Are you planning? What's on the roadmap? I just wanted to ask, like, like in terms of product development or shipping delivery, is there something on the roadmap? Uh, so you, you know, pay customs. You know, hey, the way I look at this is. Um, you know, it's such a small investment, um, like based on what you're trying to defend, right? So, you, you know, it's very hard for us to find a secure facility that's going to do yeah. everything we need to do at a price that people are willing to pay, right? So, you know, if I found a facility in Europe just to do that, I'd have to set up some other like company there oh, so that okay. tax stuff. Yeah, the costs, and then there is the cost of the facility. So, so like you know, it's just going to end up costing near the same. So, you, you know, like set up a business, buy under the business, and then expense it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the tax, or you know, and it's also the roll of the dice. The majority of the shipments that go to Europe don't really get taxed. Uh, so, you know, I know it sucks to be charged an extra like few bucks or you know fifty bucks or whatever it is, but you know, again, it's like you're trying to defend like real money. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't don't get cheap on that. It's it's just really it's it's a silly savings, right? It's a as Greg Foss likes to put it, you're picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. Exactly. Uh, what about the um, you know? <clears throat> I'm I'm thinking to um, get a block block clock. Is it block block clock block clock or is that it? The block clock, or am I mixing it up now? What was it called? You know that thing <laughs> where you can read off uh, the you know the actual the block number or the uh, sets per euro or something. The block clock, right? Is that the block clock or? Right. Yeah. So how how much is it right now? Uh, hang on. Let me take a look. I think it's at three ninety nine. Dollars, okay, okay. Nine dollars. Uh, so that would be probably 
hundred and oh, 300 ish euros, 300 euros. And how long does the shipping, uh, uh... It's in stock, we ship like immediately. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. It's uh it's a very cool device. It's hard to represent in pictures. The, you know, it's like super thick acrylic, uh, on front and back, and it's like there's gold on the PCB, a lot of gold. Uh, it, it's it, it's it really is pretty. Um, uh, in person, like uh, okay. if you have a chance to see it. And the setup is easy, or, or can you or can you also like connect it to your full node? Uh, it's fairly easy. No, it, 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 the problem with the block lock is that like. The, the brains of it are not smart enough to talk to a node. So we have we have a backend that sort of feeds information to it. Okay. And, uh, and I, remember, I remember on the Max Kaiser show, um, Stacy and Max were like furious because it wasn't working. <laughs> you were like making fun like, of it. Like, not set it up. And, and, you know, like I've offered to help them, but I think they like it like that. So <laughs> you know what? Just... Let it, it's like it takes a second to set it up. You know, you just take a picture of your phone of a QR code and you set it, it connects your Wi Fi, right? You're right. Okay. Got it. Like there's nothing to it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Rodolfo, I want to respect your time. Uh, just a few more minutes, maybe. Okay. Um, is there anything like I, we, should, we should just mention, you know, for, for the noobs out there or for people who want to get into the cold card after, you know, trying out all kinds of hardware walls, but now. Maybe, you know, we want to go the next step, the total, you know, super secure, paranoid, uh, harder wallet. Is there anything we should, we should have mentioned in terms of, I don't know, you know, privacy, uh, uh, security, decoy wallets, uh, uh, any guides, tutorials, resources? I, you know, if they go to coinkite.com slash docs, you know, read the docs. Read the community guides. Like th there really is nothing better than just actually putting some reading in, mm -hmm. watching some of those videos, uh, because they will help you clarify. And then try. I mean, you know, get the device, put like a few bucks in it, and you know, play. Right? Like send money, receive money, and 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 doing that exercise really sort of helps you like understand what's going on. And once you understand what's going on, it, it just it becomes so obvious to you. You know what I mean? It's like there really isn't much to it, um, and uh, and and if you know if you're good at like writing docs and things for other noobs, like we're welcome. Uh, you know any sort of suggestions and and uh, you know we happy to link to people's guides and uh, and things like that. I think there is a lot of information, uh, like on how to use cold card out there. Like really, it's yeah. Uh, it is surprising. Yeah, yeah there's real tons, and I, I'm, I, I, as you remember, you know, I also did did a, a translation for for the, uh, I think whose videos was it? Was it Keep It Simple Bitcoin, who, uh, whose videos I sort of translated to German. So there's a bunch of you know material on YouTube on your channel on CoinKite uh, channel in in German and you know so many other languages, of course. Yeah, you did a fairly good job there. Those were pretty long videos. No, it was fun. Thank you. Yeah, well, Rodolfo, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if there's any other, like, uh, any other information or uh, links or where can people find you or anything else? Yeah. So I'm at NVK uh, on Twitter. Uh, you know, follow our company accounts, the CoinKite one, the Cold Card one, the Open Dime one. Um, Black Friday is coming, so so bookmark uh, bitcoinblackfriday.org. Uh, if you are a company that does have uh, deals, do submit. Uh, we made it open for everybody. Um, and uh, keep an eye because we have we have a few more products coming, and uh, <laughs> it should it should be fun. Like you know, I have I have like probably like four new products coming. So like, just, wow. just uh, keep uh, keep an eye on our accounts. Yeah, yeah, and and for my listeners or followers, uh, if you want to order, uh, I have a special discount code. That's Davani, my last name, D A V A N I. And yeah, Rodolfo, that was fun. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, you know, I didn't want to go into techni technicalities all too uh, too much, just to you know give people a bigger picture, like or where pe people can find or understand the background 
like what's up with the cold car with, with, with all these topics we discussed whether it be privacy plausible deniability creating decoy wallets or you know if you want to travel around like how do you how do you you know how do you deal with those issues that's all. Uh, well listen thanks for having me and uh you, you know stay safe there in austria because uh yeah. <laughs> yeah things are weird yeah we'll see how things this whole thing develops but uh at the moment it doesn't look good to be honest with you i mean uh, they really want to like push for uh, for you know full vaccination. I mean now the unvaccinated people are you know locked down essentially. It's it's mind boggling. I, I would have never imagined. I mean, you know, that we will have a situation like that uh, in 2021. But this is I guess yeah we got to face reality <laughs> and do the best. Yeah. Anyway, Rodolfo, thanks so much again, and talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.